In this video, we're going to cover section 5.4 for IV Bio, and we're going to look at the topic of clades and cladistics. And really what we're looking at is how our organisms organized and grouped into uh, related species and ancestors. And so to begin, a clade is a group of species that includes an ancestral species and all of its descendants. Um, and really what this indicates is that there's a group of organisms evolved from a common ancestor. And so here's a diagram to help us visualize that. The red and the blue sections represent clades. Uh, they're completed branches. The green is not a clade since it does not include uh, the species of the blue box that were descended from the same ancestor as the green species. So right here would represent the ancestor to all of these different, uh, these endpoints would represent different species. And green is not a clade because these portions here, the, the blue portions here, would need to be colored in green because it would represent ancestors of this species here. Um, and so clades include all of the species alive today as well as common ancestral species that may not be present anymore. Cladistics is a process and it's an approach to systematics by placing organisms into groups or clades based primarily on common descent. Um, and so a clade is something that we use to help us organize this process of cladistics. And so before we get into how to make clades uh, or cladograms, uh, we want to talk about DNA a little bit. And our understanding of how to group organisms has advanced and changed very rapidly with new technology, primarily in being able to extract and sequence DNA. We've previously talked about how DNA is universal. The genetic code is universal, meaning that all organisms on the planet use the same four nucleotides, the five nucleotides if you include RNA, adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, and uracil and RNA. All living organisms use those four nitrogen bases, those four different types of nucleotides. And so because the, the DNA code is universal, it indicates and has shown through different experiments that, that DNA uh, genes can be transplanted from one organism to another and those proteins can still be produced. And so for example, the gene sequence that is responsible for producing legs was put into a fruit fly and into a specific location and, and thus producing legs on the head of uh, a fruit fly. Proteins are made by the same 20 different amino acids and the order or arrangement of those amino acids and the number of those amino acids is what makes the protein, each protein different or unique. One of the thing that's interesting about amino acids is that they can be left or right orientated but all actually on earth are of one orientation, they're the left orientation. Experiments have, have shown this um, and so in chemistry if we're looking at, if we're talking about chemistry um, you can talk about isomers, and that's the structural arrangement of these molecules. And so amino acids, um, although they can be both left and right orientated, they're all actually of the left orientation. Um, and so different hypotheses about this suggest that there are potentially um, these left-handed isomers uh, of the amino acids were all found uh, in meteorites that, that we've uh, actually found other meteorites that have crashed on Earth and been able to extract amino acids from them and have found this case. And so in a good example of the evidence that suggests uh, DNA is linked for all living organisms and all living organisms use the same DNA is found in a particular protein called the cytochrome C protein. And this protein is used in the electron transport chain. Uh, it is used to help be able to produce ATP. And it's, uh, depending on the species, about 100 to 104 amino acid protein. Um, and it's found in plants and animals and unicellular organisms. And what's unique about it is it's extremely complex. And for it to have evolved independently in all of these different organisms um, doesn't, is not mathematically or statistically, uh, it's very in, unlikely and most likely impossible because all of, the, all of these different living organisms have this protein and it is nearly identical in all these different species. And so what this suggests then that this DNA for this protein must have all come from a common ancestor. Um, and so what we can do is in knowing this and, and using this as an example, we can examine gene sequences of different species to 
try to help organize organisms into different clades or into similar groups. And so variations in the DNA sequence for, for proteins exist between species. Species with less variation in their DNA and gene sequence would be expected to be more closely related. For example, the cytochrome C is not the same in all species. For example, the rhesus monkey has a therine rather than an isoleucine amino acid as the 66th amino acid. So we talked about there being about 100 to 104 amino acids. Well, the 66th version between rhesus monkeys and, um, and humans and chimps is different. It's a different amino acid. And so what this suggests is that humans and chimps are more closely related uh, to one another than they are to rhesus mon monkeys. So here's some pictures of those. And these variations can be caused by mutations. Um, oftentimes that is one of the things that's causing differences between DNA sequences. And although some mutations don't do anything, they don't have any effect, sometimes those mutations actually can cause differences. And so if we look at these four different uh, sequences here, which of the following two species are most closely related in comparison to number one? So which two, three, or four is most closely related? And what you should do is take a look at this, and you can deduce this or figure this out by comparing two, three, and four to the number one sequence and looking for the number of differences. So go ahead and take a minute to do that. And then the next slide we'll look at and, how, and, and discuss how we can, we can compare. So hopefully you notice that uh, number three has only one base pair difference uh, from number one and therefore is most, most likely the closely related. Number four has two more base pairs in difference um, and is less related to number one. Number two has four different base pairs, which are different than those of three and four, suggesting it is the least related to uh, the DNA sequence from, from whatever species is number one. And it's also probably the least related to three and four. Sequence um, differences in the amino sequence uh, accumulate gradually. And there's actually a positive correlation between the number of differences between two species and the time since they've diverged from a common ancestor. And so we can use this information, um, the differences in the amino acid sequence due to mutations, to use this, this knowing this positive correlation, um, we can use this as a means of a clock. Um, these mutations occur at, a, if they occur at a constant rate, uh, we can use that to measure the divergence between two different species. So for example, if a species has if a species A has five differences from species B in terms of its DNA sequence and ten differences from species C, A and C must have split twice as long ago as A and B. So I'll say that one more time. If, if A and B species here have five differences in their DNA sequence and A and C have 10 differences in their DNA sequence. And if we know and, and can accept that the differences uh, in the DNA sequences have accumulated at a constant rate, we can assume that A and C are not as closely related, and A and B are, are um, more closely related, and A and C must have split twice as long ago as A and B. And so all of this kind of boils back to or comes back to the idea of homologous and analogous structures. Many organisms share structural similarities, and this comes from and is caused by the DNA sequence. And so homologous structures are structures that we see similar in structure, um, position, and development, and they are similar because of a common ancestor. But they may not be similar necessarily in function. And a great example is the pentadactyl arm bones that we see in a number of different species. Humans. Um, have a number of different bones in their arm uh, that, we're, that we're talking about here, the radius, ulna, um, uh, metacarpals, carpals, phalanges, the hand bones. Whales have the same bones, but they're slightly different uh, structures, very, very similar, but used obviously for different purposes. So Kevin Durant dunking for whale swimming, blue whale swimming, uh, humpback whale swimming. Um, and so these arm bones, because they're similar in structure, suggests that these species share a common ancestor. Analogous structures are the opposite. And although these are similar in function and what they're used for, they're different in their fundamental structures. The wings of an insect and the wings of a bird, very, very different, not, not common 
uh, in terms of their, in their, in their structure, same function but different structure. And so what this suggests is that they don't share a common ancestor. So cladograms can indicate the relationship among organisms. Um, cladograms are divided into clades, and clades are groups of organisms on uh, a cladogram who share common characteristics. And, and really what cladograms are doing are they're kind of a tree-like diagram that show the most probable sequence of divergence in clades or in species. And in the past, it's been based off of structural um, characteristics that we can observe. Now it's entirely or almost exclusively based off of examination of the amino acid sequence. And so in looking at a primate cladogram, the closest relatives of humans are chimps and bonobos. And this is based off of the DNA evidence for a cladogram construction. We can, we can remove, extract DNA from these different species, uh, examine them and compare them to, to determine the amount of differences. And so the DNA evidence suggests that the split or the separation, we call it a node, between the ancestor of chimps and bonobo and the ancestor of humans diverged about four and a half million years ago. Let's take a closer look at the different parts of a cladogram. The node right here represents the uh, taxonic unit. Um, and this can be an existing species or an ancestor. The clade right here is a group of two or more taxa or organisms or DNA sequences that includes the common ancestor and all of their descendants. And lastly, the root is a common ancestor of all the taxa. So right here would be the root. Here's our node and this is representing a clade right here. Here are two different cladograms, and these are actually showing the same thing. They're just slightly, uh, have a slightly different arrangement. The tree diagrams show uh, the most probable sequence of divergence of clades and can provide a strong evidence for evolutionary history of a group, uh, but, but it can't provide complete or, or uh, exclusive proof. And so in, in these two diagrams we see here, right here and here, are representing a node uh, or the common ancestor for A and B common ancestor for A and B. The terminal nodes would be A, B, and C. There's nothing that goes past those or, or, or further than those. Uh, sister clades share a common ancestor. So A and B share a common ancestor, which would be at this node. And then the root organism would be whatever this is here, here or here. And so this is representing the ancestor for all of the species within this cladogram. So the figwort family is a family of plants, of flowering plants, of annuals and perennials, um, mostly herbs as well as uh, some shrubs. And they're usually found in very temperate areas, including kind of some tropical mountain areas. Originally, it was one of the largest families of angiosperms. Um, but after comparing uh, DNA sequences um, and, and, and examining the evolutionary origins of these different species, really what we found out is that they had been identified incorrectly and a large number of the organisms um, were incorrectly included in this family. And so there were five clades in, in one family, and so there was some mis, uh, misidentification of this. And because of our ability now to extract the DNA, uh, we were able to examine these different, different species and reassign uh, these five different clades uh, from one original family. And so the last part of this video, we want to look at how to construct a cladogram. Here's an example of a cladogram, and each one of these characteristics is what's being used as a means of a separation point. And so what this shows is that past this point of a bony skeleton, all of these other organisms along the cladogram have a bony skeleton, or in this case, have four limbs moving forward. And so the steps to com compiling a cladogram, number one, compile the characteristics into a table, like so. Number two, construct a Venn diagram using the table data. You want to start with the characteristics shared by all the taxa in, a bit in the largest circle and then move outwards or up if you, if you want to think of it more of a 3D structure. And then lastly, from that Venn diagram, you want to convert it into a cladogram and then have your different characteristics used to separate and show cladograms. In class, we're going to look at some different cladograms and analyze some cladograms in order to, to gain some further practice um, in making and analyzing these further. Cladograms and cladistics, again, used to help arrange and classify organisms based off of characteristics, whether those be physical or DNA characteristics.